Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Today, I've got a very special treat for everyone. I'm sitting here with my good friend, a man of God, Brother Reverend Max Manning. And we're going to take a few moments today and just talk about what God has done in the earth, uh, in the past moves of God, um, and specifically in the Voice of Healing movement. Um, Reverend Manning is, to my knowledge, one of the last Voice of Healing ministers still around today from that era. There may be others, I just don't know. I know Dr. Sorello just went on to be with the Lord recently, and God has really blessed my life with his friendship and mentorship and companionship over the last six years or so. We've been to Haiti a number of times, six or seven times, I would say, in ministry. And um, so today we're going to sit down and share a few moments and really just talk about what it is that God has done in and through your ministry and what you've been a part and seen God do in that era. So if you wouldn't mind, uh, Brother Manning, just uh, introduce yourself and for a moment. I remember the wonderful times we've had in Haiti, the move of God. I think something that impressed me greatly was a couple of hours before each service, I found you on your knees interceding to God. You realized that God must move in a special way. And then you came out preaching on fire for God. That, that was always a great blessing. Yeah an inspiration to me and is a good example for the pastors and friends that we came to know. Um, I'm Reverend Max Manning. I'm 92 years old now and I'm healthy and happy and walking with the Lord and uh, still carrying my load. I've been on daily radio now 64 years. Yeah. I think one of the miracles of that dates back to the time when God gave me divine visitation. And when I was concerned about financially, how could I do the things he was calling me to do? And he said, I will provide. Yeah. And so uh, these 64 years, I've never been charged for airtime. And I think that is a miracle and wow. here in my community, I ask WIBW Radio, uh, the, one of the managers, I said, how is it that you don't charge me for airtime? I said, I'm asking uh, just for knowledge, and but I said, I'm so grateful. Yeah. Uh, and he said, well, Reverend Manning, you're an icon. So... I didn't know what an icon might be. I had to go home, look in the <laughs> dictionary, and I just felt it was divine favor. Yeah. And of course, Brother Roger here, uh, they treat me just the same. And it's been a pleasure to be on their radio program uh, for several years. And what else you, yeah. you can say? Could you uh, just, if you don't mind, take a few moments and uh, share with us how it is that growing up when you first heard of the Pentecostal experience and how it is that you received the infilling of the Holy Spirit and your call to ministry? Well, uh, the year was 1935. Uh, we had moved from the Ozarks. That's where I was born yeah. at a place you wouldn't recognize uh, near Ava, Missouri called Squires. And I was born out on a farm along with the siblings that we had. And uh, we moved in early, uh, just before 1935, to Fredonia, Kansas, in southern Kansas. And in those days, many children that were born, yeah. they went through some very difficult times. And uh, many of them had polio. Mm -hmm. And my sister, Catherine, uh, she was about 12 years of age and such a lovely uh, girl. Uh, and uh, so it broke our hearts. She had diphtheria and I believe it's locked jaw. Yeah. 
And uh, we had two, two doctors in the community that came down to our house where she was sick and passing. And uh, they was able to witness a miracle like they had never seen and like we had never known. We didn't know Jesus. Now, my mother did, uh, but it was more of a quiet yeah. thing before she knew about Pentecost. And uh, so Catherine died that day. We were all sorrowful and grieving. Yeah. We'd never known death in our family. And uh, there's wow. two doctors, Dr. Flack and Dr. Kilpatrick came and they were standing there and uh, they acknowledged she had passed. They could find no vital signs. Yeah. And so they asked, could they pull a little covering over her face because her eyes were were set and um, so about that time well it was about two hours they stayed with us mm -hmm. and about that time uh, there was five ladies that came people that we didn't know and they all had the same style of hair <laughs> the hair rolled up on the back yeah. of their head and uh, they were dressed very plainly a print dress and they they looked different to me they they were not talking and chattering and they just came in reverently and uh now two two hours had already passed and they said so she had been dead for two hours yes she had and the doctor still lingered in those days you know they the doctors walked to wow. their appointment they didn't have cars and so or these didn't have cars so these ladies said my mother was weeping so and they said um, uh, miss manning may we pray for catherine and mother's lips trembled i remember looking at her and and feeling so sad and when she it seemed like when mother cried we all cried yeah you know and so they said uh, she said well, she's, she's gone, she's dead. Said, we know, but may we pray. Yeah. So they stepped over and as a child, I never heard another language, but I thought I was hearing something more than just yeah. English language. But they very quietly prayed and laid their hands on Catherine out of her body. And uh, of course she was under cover. And uh, suddenly, there was movement and uh, so the cover came off and Catherine raised up in the from the bed and she looked at mother and we were all astonished and we'd never heard of a miracle praise the Lord and so Catherine said mama I'm hungry <laughs> well, she had had lockjaw it had been about five days since yeah. she had eaten so she would be hungry but the ladies had just quietly, after they prayed, stepped off of the porch and went their way. Yeah. We was to meet them later at a Pentecostal church. So I'm sure you knew the yeah. morning they were carrying. I can guarantee you. And, you know, Jesus said, heal the sick, That's raise right. the dead. And that literally happened. Well, so I go to the Marines in 1945, and I could have been... Uh, lost my life there, but God protected me. Mother yeah. prayed, and and uh, so I was to go for about eight years uh, serving our nation. Well, when by then uh, Mary and I were married, this year we would be married seventy-five years. Oh, wow. And uh, but we had sixty-eight wonderful years together. She. She was a Presbyterian girl, but she didn't know anything about uh, the full gospel. And uh, so when I had been out of church for years, uh, and uh, I said, Mary, uh, we, ought to, we ought to try church, we ought to go to church. And my brother was a pastor. He pastored 50 years before he passed yeah. away. And uh, that was Jerry. And so he was preaching one Sunday morning, and uh, in we walked. But I knew as we stepped up the steps, I could feel 
conviction. First time mm. really in my life. I mean, real. Yeah. God has to get us lost before he can get he saved. Does. And so I was feeling conviction. And Mary had never been born again. She was a lovely uh, moral girl, but uh, she didn't know Christ yeah. like, like we came to know him. So that Sunday morning, uh, and the saints were, oh, they were so happy and weeping as they worshiped. And I knew it was kind of a connection like I had yeah. seen in, in my childhood. And so uh, I wondered when my brother would stop preaching because <laughs> we, were, we were wanting to run to the altar. <laughs> and uh, I, I used, as children, I would watch people, they'd literally run to the altar, you know, yeah. to get saved. And so anyway, we, uh, we responded that morning and uh, had a wonderful deliverance from darkness yeah. into eternal life. And that's been going on now about close to 70 Praise years. Praise the now. Lord. Yeah. And uh, so I, my dear wife, I think you know Brother Chad, yeah. she passed six years ago. And she played seven instruments and sang, and I miss that also so much in my ministry. Uh, she was just, we was on the same page, yeah. you know, walking with the Lord. Amen. Now, Reverend Manning, you mentioned um, in our discussions previously, um, you had had a close association and friendship with Reverend Gordon Lindsay for many years. Yes. How is it? How did you come to meet? Brother Lindsay and get introduced into the Voice of Healing uh, mm -hmm. movement. Well, he had he invited me, and uh, I, I'd met him on occasion, and then we became good friends. I I thought Gordon and Preeta Lindsay were just top of the line. Yeah. They they uh, now I might mention. Uh, I don't know if you want me to mention things like this. But Brother Lindsay, he had Christ for the Nations yeah. and, uh, of course, a voice of healing mm -hmm. prior to that. But Christ for the Nations was prospering and growing yeah. and, and so many, turning out so many preachers. And um, so the Assemblies of God, we both were in the Assemblies of, at that time. And, uh, I mean, we had members sure. of, of the fellowship. And so... The brethren at Springfield were pressing him to bring this under the auspices of the assembly. Yeah. And he came to my house one time and he spent five days in fasting and prayer. Yeah. He wanted to be in my basement uh, where he could just seek the Lord. And he wanted a final word from God. Was he to do this? He was struggling. Yeah. He always wanted to obey God, but that didn't seem right to him mm -hmm. because he told the assemblies, he said, well, 40% of our income is not coming from the assemblies of yeah. God. So he didn't feel that was right mm -hmm. to just place it under their sure. auspices. So anyway, um, he was then on his way down to Springfield, Missouri, and uh, we'd had some long talks and Mary and I had had some talks. We didn't have anything against the Assemblies of God, doctrinally, or, yeah. but we we thought the way the Lord is leading us in our ministry and more and more in missions, that we shouldn't have a, uh, just belong to one denomination. Sure. We So we, we sent our credentials in, and it took them a year or two to approve it, or <laughs> accept it. Not that we were so special, but I don't know what yeah. that delay was. We did work and help grow their churches and and plant a few churches. Yeah. But anyway, um, Gordon made that decision at that time. And then came the time when he was, uh, there were so many preachers in those days uh, going out on their own. They didn't yeah. know where to go. And uh, they didn't know so much about independent churches at that time. So he felt strongly that there should be an opportunity yeah. where 
you could ha issue credentials and and ordain sure. preachers. So he asked me to assist in that manner. Uh, I was already on his, by this time I was on his board at, that he had established. And oh, there was men like, uh, well, it'd be a lot of, a lot of preachers. That, yeah. uh, if I mentioned some was on the board, Brother Valdez and, yeah. and uh, uh, what is it? Preacher, sure I had a senior moment here on. Dr. Summerall was Summerall there. Summerall was yeah. there, yeah. And, uh, well, just s some good men like that. Yeah. And, of course, we were, we were on the board. And then after three or four years, I was, I told him, I said, you know, I should decline uh, being nominated because uh, I was going overseas so much and yeah. I couldn't get to their meetings. And so he understood that, but he was a wonderful teacher, yeah. Gordon Lindsay, wrote many, many books and uh, was well thought of. Yeah. Now, Reverend Manning, in your book that you've written, you mentioned something about um, Brother William Branham and how God had used him to bring a healing to your body where you were injured. Could you talk for a few moments about what had happened to you, yeah. how God used Brother Branham, and if you didn't mind, just share with us a little bit about who um, Brother Branham was, mm -hmm. for those that might not be aware. Yeah, when I first met him, uh, of course, I, I think everyone knows about his early life, and he was rather unlearned man, and I know when he'd read the Bible, he would it looked like he's having difficulty, yeah. but he was a very humble man. And, uh, well, the occasion I had where he came to my hospital uh, bed and prayed for me, in 1964 of June, my wife and I had started a church at Linden, Kansas, which is about 30 miles from here. And um, the Lord had dealt with us strongly. He, We were leaving... Uh, we was leaving Texarkana, Texas yeah. to go down into Oklahoma. And uh, it was around midnight. I thought Mary was asleep, and uh, but she heard the voice of God. I think we had three times she heard the voice of God yeah. when I did. But we were on the same page, you know, and as a wife, you know, you're, you're right in the ministry <laughs> there. Right. And uh, so we were driving and full intention going to Oklahoma to Brother Colburn's church at First Assembly in Okmulgee, something like that. Yeah. And so I thought she was sleeping, and so I was driving at night to get to our journey, long ways to drive, and suddenly the Lord spoke and he said, I have sought for a man. And I replied audibly, I said, I was so shocked. And uh, yeah. I, I said, well, Lord, I, I've been your man. I've just finished two weeks of meeting. I've held day meetings and the evening meeting and worked the altar, preached the best I could. And uh, and I said, I, I am your man. I was yeah. sort of felt, you know, what more could I sure. do? And then he said, but I sought for a man to stand in the gap. Mm. I could find none. And then I replied, well, Lord, where did you, where is this? Yeah. And he said, Linden, Kansas. Now, I don't know how long God had been searching for a man to go there and to plant a church. That's what he said, yeah. to plant a church. And I was only going to be there a, a year or less I because that was the way the Lord used me, you know, and still uses me that way uh, to travel. And so I said, well, Lord, I'll be your man. Mm. But I said, uh, and he wanted me to go right then is the way that I felt. So I called Brother Colburn, woke him up. I said, Brother Colburn, I've had a visitation from God. I hope you will forgive me, but we're not going to come for revival. He'd had it announced. Yeah. I wasn't a great evangelist like you, but I'm, <laughs> I, uh, 
I, I was in for winning souls. Yeah. And just uh, so I need to set in your classes. <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> so anyway, um, uh, I pulled a car over, and I said, "Well, Mary." Oh, I said, "Mary, God has spoken to me," and she was weeping. She said, "I know," and she told me what he'd said. Yeah. And. Uh, I think it's so wonderful that it happened that way. It's a good memory. And so I pulled over and I took a pad of paper and what you see at Linden, Kansas is what I just drew out. And I thought since we didn't have, uh, you know, we've never taken, uh, taken salaries and um, uh, we've taken offerings yeah. for, uh, car allowance and things like that. But I drew this out and I thought, well, I'm gonna just work a little tiny kitchen in there because that would be, you know, we had a little 14 foot uh, camper trailer yeah. that we, we didn't want to impose on churches. And in those days, I know churches have prospered a lot through the years and uh, so, I mean, they do more for an evangelist than they did back yeah. in those years. And so uh, I thought we could we could pull the, the trailer there. And so I drew it out exactly like you see it down there. But the, the great mystery was I got to Fort Smith, Arkansas, and we were passing through there. And there was a military barracks about a, I, I won't say about a 40 by 80, it was big. And um, so I, it said for sale, it was, it was off of the army base out, already out there on the sand. I said, Mary, that'll be our church. Yeah. And she didn't know what I was talking about. I said, well, that could be dissected, sections could be moved and we wouldn't have a big debt for church. And uh, so I said, here, here it is, uh, like on the paper. I said, that's, that's what God gave me. And so um, I called Brother Glenn Broadus, a friend of mine from Meriden, Kansas. I knew he had 18 wheeler trucks and he had, he had done things like that. And I asked him, this was about six in the morning. I said, uh, could you uh, could you dissect this and move these sections down to Linden, Kansas? Mm -hmm. And uh, he said he could. He said, I could do it right away. So I, I had to talk to the owner. I found the owner right quick. And I said, uh, I'm a preacher and I'm going to plant a church. And I said, you got this building for sale. Uh, what do you want for it? Well, he said, you're a preacher. He said, maybe you don't want to pay me what I really am asking, but said, you can have that since you're going to build a yeah. church. I think it was $850. Oh, wow. And so I gave him a check. I said, can you hold that two days? I knew that a banker that would, I could, he sure. would stand good for that. And so the same day we arrived then in Linden uh, and it was uh, sort of late morning. And as we drove in town from the south, I said, Mary, that's the, that's the ground the Lord wants us to have. It looked like about eight or and a half. And uh, it was just empty ground. And I said, I think the people that own that live right up here on the hill. So we went over there first, and uh, first before we'd yeah. done anything. And I mean, the Lord was in all of this, you know, he was leading me and, and I had to have leading like that to accomplish this. And this Mr. and Mrs. Gray up there, they were elderly, about my I am now, and so I said, uh, do you happen to own this ground? Or they said, they looked at each other, they said, yes, we do. Yeah. 
and said, what's the occasion? I said, well, uh, the Lord spoke to me to come and plant a church. And I said, I feel I'm to buy that ground. And they looked at each other and uh, I asked him how much they would charge. And uh, well, he said, Ma, I guess we could sell it for a thousand dollars since we're gonna build a church. And I said, well, could you wait two days? Uh, could we go ahead and proceed in agreement? And could you wait two days till, now what I'm talking, people, yeah. that's not my normal way of doing business. Sure. But I, I said, um, could you hold the check for two days? And they said, well, yes. And said, when did you want to do this? I said, well, could we go down to the abstract and I said, we'll just call it uh, Calvary Assembly of God. Yeah. I was yet with the assemblies, but I was, I was doing things that that isn't the way they do business. Yeah. Usually the presbyters and all have to, yeah. they have to sanction what you're doing. You just took the initiative. Well, I mean, God was leading right. me and I, well, so I was on my journey. So anyway, um, I uh, we went down and I got that I put Calvary Assembly of God at Linden, Kansas, and uh, I just put my I had to be a signature on that, and so then I asked him. I said, uh, "Well, do you know who the city fathers are?" I didn't know how to express that. Yeah. Well, they said there's five people. He gave me their names. Uh, the the old gentleman did. One had the lumber yard, one was a real estate person, and another one worked in the county courthouse. And so I asked someone, could you get these with me? I said, it's very urgent. I meet them this afternoon, it was early afternoon. And it's amazing, they all thought something exciting was gonna happen, yeah. so they came not knowing why they were there. And so uh, Mary and I, I told him, I said, God has spoken to me. And I said, uh, we're gonna plant the church. I already have the land from Miss and Mrs. Gray and the church will be right there on the main street. And um, so they asked some uh, typical questions. And one, the lumberyard man said, I didn't know he was really the lumberyard man yet yeah. until he talked. And, uh, he, he, uh, they said, where are you going to get the material to construct it? I said, well, I'm going to use the, all the local plumber, the electric man and the concrete man. And I had been alerted. He was the lumber man. I said, and we have some lumber. I didn't tell him all yeah. that I had because I didn't know myself. And, um, so I said, we'll buy everything else from you. Well, I, they said, what did they, they, what did I want? I wanted a building permit and I need one right now so I can continue my plans. And they looked at each other, well, it's $30. And so I, I, they, they voted to do it. And so they, they got me a permit that very day. No, so, um you end up getting, while you're constructing this church, Calvary Assembly, yeah. you get injured. Um, is yeah. it the, the steel beams, they, they collapse on you? Yeah, sure. Well, and I had uh, 17 men, some of them are still living down there. They witnessed this. There's a couple of yeah. still living. And so they get up on uh, the big truck was there and I had a feeling somebody might get hurt and I, I was gonna be the point man. I got down there around the foundation and they were going to ease that down, but it was two tons of material. Oh, wow. And suddenly uh, I looked up, I seen them all in place and uh, they were easing, going to ease it down. And there was a powerful gust of wind. Now, Brother Branham saw that and he said, the devil, I tried to kill you. Yeah. 
but God let it on the go. He saw that in a vision. Uh, he the did. Lord had given him yeah, a vision. Yeah, he did. Well, he, see, this, he had been miles away when that happened, correct? And then had yeah. heard it. Well, yes. Uh, yeah, and then he came. Yeah. Well, see, this uh, this came down, and it drove my head between my knees, just flop, you know, and I had 62 broken wow. bones. All of my ribs were broke right in two. They weren't just a mild thing. No, that was terrible. And my liver and spleen was damaged. My left knee was broken. Yeah. My ankle bone broken. And all the bones on top of the feet, they were bent up like that. Wow. It was terrible. And the doctor came. He was just three blocks away. And he pronounced me dead. My God. It's on the record that but I didn't go anywhere. I didn't go to heaven or <laughs> anywhere. I just, I was not completely wow. out, and they couldn't find any vital signs. Yeah. So uh, they, uh, oh, I'd, I went to a dental hygienist uh, here uh, three or four years ago, and uh, she married the doctor's son, mm -hmm. and he had seen in the book where Max Manning I was deceased. Yeah. They'd never taken that off the book. <laughs> and so, uh, anyway, uh, she said, you know, I'm married to a young man who said he, uh, he says that, oh, I, I t she told him that I was one of his, her client. And well, he said, that couldn't be. He said to Max Manning, I know by record, he was crushed under a building. My dad put down, he, he was deceased. But said he was very much alive and said, <laughs> said I'm, I'm oh, going wow. to serve him today. So anyway, that was kind of funny. And, um, but anyway, when this came down, the brothers, uh, they were lifting to mm -hmm. get that off and it was quite a job and get me out from under all that and I had a conscious thought when I and I my thought was Lord I'm too damaged yeah I, I can't I can't live through this it was horrible up there. yeah I was beginning to feel the brother Branham came and um, he went into a vision, you know, he was always in visions. Yeah. I heard him say one time, Lord, there's so many visions. I guess it affected him uh, tired out, yeah. it all carried the weight of that. But he softly spoke, he said, Brother Manning said, the Lord showed me. Now, nobody had told him, but he went into detail. He saw all of that. Wow. And. Uh, then he said, uh, the Lord let it go so far, but he, you know, you have the written word and the spoken word. That's right. Well, here he was speaking, he's, and I was hanging on to that yeah. because I believed in the way God used him. And he said, uh, uh, you will live, you will recover wow. totally, completely. Well, I thought when he prayed for me, I would see all the things. Uh -huh. I'd, I'd seen hunchback straighten up. Mm -hmm. I'd seen arms and legs lengthen and, and deaf mutes get a, get a miracle. So I thought that would be my portion yeah. and I'd get rid of all of this because really it, the shock, it did start turning my hair sure. gray. And so anyway, um, he prayed and, and then we talked and he finished and I didn't feel any different. It's horrible pain. All my tendons and muscles were torn. Yeah. And that was worse than the breaks. Uh, horrible thing. Uh, it, but anyway, uh, then I began to be healed from that moment. On. Now you mentioned in that, in that miracle where God had used Brother Branham to come into your hospital room and you had thought that he would lay hands on you and you would get your miracle the way many people did yeah. in those days through his ministry oh, yeah. but he rather he stood there and he just spoke the word that's it and so 
I think that's important to talk about for a minute because sometimes we get focused on a man mm -hmm. and when really we can just hang on the prophetic word or the spoken word. And so he stood there and all he said was, you'll recover. Yeah, I, I took that as seriously as if I was reading yeah. the Bible uh, of the miracles in the Bible. It was mine. Yeah. Uh, and I didn't, I wasn't exalting him. Sure. He was a very humble man and he would never, you know, the Lord said he wouldn't share any of his glory with any man. That's right. Whether William Branham or anyone. And that's, uh, but he was very humble. Yeah. But uh, I've, I've watched him hundreds of times. People that I knew, people yeah. had been in, my churches, mm -hmm. and uh, he would tell them their name, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I was, I was, uh, I was shocked. Uh, I mean, it's just like re yeah. reading. He would tell them their social security number if they wanted. Yeah. He'd tell them what address or what, what town they came from. Wow! And you live, you live here. Is that right, sister? You yeah. live. Well. Uh, it's amazing, but I, mm. I watched it hundreds of times. So why should I ever doubt That's right. when he was speaking a word to me? Yeah. And uh, I believed it with all of my heart and I had no doubt. And I just uh, wanted to hurry the, hurry it up a little bit. But wow. that was God's way. And I think he, he let me go through that for a reason. Mm. I would I would be more effective in my serving others mm -hmm. and um, yeah yeah brother Branham was was a man mightily used of God yes, he was. and uh, I I know the day that he passed I talked to uh, a pastor there uh, the big first assembly church in Amarillo I believe yeah. it was and um, it had happened down below Amarillo but they brought him and his wife and his son was in the second mm -hmm. car, Billy, I believe. And uh, well, I, I I talked to Sister Branham, uh, and I said, you know, Sister, I was wanting to comfort her. Yeah. Now you had had um, obviously known William Branham for a while, um, and men like Jack Coe and A.A. A. Allen. Yeah. Uh, what could you tell us maybe a little bit about what what you saw God do through their ministries? Yeah. Uh, he would point me out to come people, uh, personal work at the yeah. altar, and, and I would reluctantly go because I wasn't with his uh, group, and uh, you know, the, but I, but I went and prayed, and he yeah. would, he'd point out things that uh, see them through or, or this and what's the Holy Spirit you know and uh, so I, I couldn't believe uh, I'd seen how God used him so miraculously yeah. but I saw miracle after miracles and uh, there was one lady uh, she was a black lady mm -hmm. and I witnessed this I was shocked uh, she wanted to lose 50 pounds. Wow. And her dress was uh, showing it. Was tight. Maybe she tight. Yeah. yeah. And so, anyway, um, he prayed for her and he said, Sister, check yourself. And he pulled uh -huh. on her dress. It was loose. Wow. Where did that go? Where did that go to? <laughs> but I witnessed that with my eyes. Praise God. Yeah. We need diet programs like that. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> yeah, that would be popular. Wow, that's well, a miracle. Yeah. And then Jack Cole, uh, the first time I witnessed him, uh, he was uh, in a big tent. Yeah. Uh, I think he said it would seat 10,000. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went, I had another fellow, he was from Topeka Rescue Mission, and uh, he had need of miracles, you know, sure. and uh, so I I drove there, and it just happened that I there, the the 
the tent was full, so I just went right in the front row and sat down. Yeah. I was just front row person. And uh, so he um, he had a man, I think his name was Anderson, that was the front man. He'd lead the singing, and then he'd introduce Jack yeah. Cole. And uh, Jack Cole was a huge man, uh -huh. big, uh, but he was, uh, he was powerful in all of his demonstration. I saw him <laughs> step down. Oh, they turned the service to him, so mm -hmm. he went right to work. He came right down, and there was about 20 or 30 wheelchairs. Yeah. Uh, they were crippled up people, and I was sitting within 20 feet of that, and I thought, what is he going to do? I'd never seen him in action. and. Uh, but he sang, though God slay me yet, I'll trust him, something yeah. like that. And, uh, but I saw, I saw him going into action and he, uh, he didn't say anything. He just grabbed him and pulled him out of the wheelchair <laughs> in Jesus name. And you either had to stand or fall. I mean, you, <laughs> it was amazing to yeah. me. And then, then he had, after he'd done, emptied about all the wheelchairs, uh, and most of them were walking. Praise I, I God. Don't know how, I don't know how complete it was, but they were they yeah. were doing something I wasn't doing before. And then he had a healing line, and um, he uh, this this shocked me nearly to death because I'd never seen anything like this. <laughs> um, there was a lady came, and uh, she had cancer. Yeah. He she told him where it was in her body and uh, he had also a tent I think it's a prayer tent sure and so uh, he said to you do you believe that God's going to heal you and he doubled up his fist uh -huh. and he was huge and he punched her and she nearly doubled up wow and uh, then she's he said I believe you got your healing and she said yes and so he had a lady go back with her, uh -huh. and and she had her miracle. And then there was a man wanted to be delivered from tobacco, and he uh -huh. had cancer in his head. He had a bandage on his head, and uh, he said, "Dad, he said, uh, do you smoke?" And he said weakly, "He said yes." <laughs> and uh, he said, "If God delivers you." Uh, and heals you, will you serve him? Will you get rid of that tobacco habit? And he meekly said yes, and he whapped him right where his... Right on the head. On his head where he probably had surgery. But God healed him and delivered him. And I, I sat there and I got sick. I thought, uh -huh. I've never seen nothing like this. That it, reminds me of Smith Wigglesworth stories. Oh. How he would operate often. Now, that reminds me of a story that you had told where you had met um, Brother David Duplessis, yes. who had spent some time with Brother Wigglesworth. Yeah. Um, would you mind sharing with us a little bit about about him? And Well, yeah, uh, there was a gathering of we preachers, and uh, I don't recall all of the occasion, but Brother Lindsay was mm -hmm. uh, Master of Ceremonies, and uh, I was sitting there by uh, by this man that he was known as the world uh, secretary for all the yeah. Pentecostal bodies. They called him Mr. Pentecost. Mr. Pentecost. And so the meeting went on and, and we we had different ones. There was a brother there's a brother that was mightily used of God during World War II from Houston, Texas. Yeah. I'm trying to think his name. He's a little fellow, uh -huh. but they said that he won millions of souls. And uh, and during World War II, he went into the army camps and preached. But I I can't think of his name. I know it immediately. But he's just he's just a little fellow. Yeah. And very short and thin. And uh, so we heard his testimony and uh, how God used him and different ones, uh, so forth. So when that session was over, 
Uh, I ask uh, Brother, uh, the secretary. Yeah, Brother Duplessis. Duplessis. I ask him, uh, I said, uh, could you tell me how I could go down to, uh, this was in Dallas, mm -hmm. I need to get some personal things, and he said, well, I'll take you. Yeah. I said, you'll take me? Well, he said, yes, yes, you just go out to my car and we'll, the meeting is over, and I'll take you. Oh, so wow. he took me, and we had a nice chat, and he brought me back, and, yeah. uh, but, I thought, here is a guy, well, Mr. Pentecost, mm -hmm. and and uh, so I enjoyed meeting him. I I didn't become fast friends of all these people yeah. that I knew, but I was in their meetings. I witnessed the power of God upon them, yeah. and uh, the mighty anointing of God, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, then I was to have a lot of them in pulpits where I would plant a sure. church or have meetings and now you knew W. V. Grant Sr. Oh, yeah. quite well also yeah, I, I saw him just about a week before he died yeah uh, yes and my uh, lady Dolores Sig mm -hmm. uh, she was uh, in my church piano player and uh, she had a great gift she was from Ottawa Kansas and uh, later she married a man yeah. from there and uh, but uh, so she went down to uh, Dallas and became W. Grant's personal secretary so I had occasion to s talk with him yeah. several times but I'd been in his meetings and he was mightily used of God and he loved to see people get the Holy Ghost oh yeah yeah he he did and uh he would try to help give it to them, you know. <laughs> He'd lay hands on them, and, and I saw so many filled. But he was a little Arkansas man. Yeah. And, uh, he was a good man. Now, what was it like ministering in those days, um, preaching in that era of the Voice of Healing era, where God was just pouring his spirit out in such power, mere powerful miracles under all of those tents and you were a tent evangelist also yeah. and what was it like ministering in in those days and and maybe what some of the greatest miracles that you saw god do yeah now i i have to clarify i was never a big big evangelist yeah. although i had i had a total of nine tents most of the tornadoes got most of them you <laughs> know you had to live with those tents, you know. Sure. And so, but yes, um, now all of these men, uh, it's amazing. Some started out well, yeah. used mightily. And I listened to them, how they started out, how, uh, how they were so dependent on God and how they had to have miracles mm -hmm. in their lives and a miracle ministry. Well, uh, Sadly, some of them didn't always follow. Yeah. And I saw some of the end of some of them, uh, and that grieved my spirit. I, 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 not judging where they went from this life, but it was, yeah. it, it was sad that I saw. Uh, but anyway, uh, they all had a, uh, had about the same message, they had a deliverance message. Yeah. They, uh, they believed God for great miracles and seemed to me like they were all on the same page and god was really across america they they well brother lindsay he would have maybe 20 evangelists listed in his magazine uh -huh. and he would tell where they were going to be or what city or what country some of them went sure. out beyond uh, the philippines and so on and uh, so uh but they all had a deliverance ministry, mm -hmm. and they had great boldness, you know. And uh, Alton Hayes, you know, sure. he he started out mightily, and uh, he was one of the first ones that I met. He was uh, now his daughter married W. P. Grant Jr. Yeah, and uh, they're good friends of mine. But so. Now with. Um with knowing and ministering alongside of many of those, 
God has also used you in the nation of Haiti. Um, could you talk to us a little bit about how how it is that you got introduced into that nation? Yeah. And I believe you've planted probably maybe 200 or more churches. It's 103. Yeah. Well, when I planted, I either restored some uh, or did a roof. I've, I've, we've been, I think we got 103 back and running. Yeah. And yes, uh, I had a guest. He was the, he was um, Dr. Arthur Bonhomme. Okay. He grew up with Papa Doc, Francois de Valier, yeah. and uh, in Haiti, they were neighbors. And Papa Doc was uh, a medical doctor and also a voodoo priest. Wow. And uh, I had not heard much about him. I know there's newspapers, a lot of times things would happen in Haiti and we'd read. And I didn't know much about Haiti. And so Arthur Bonham, he was in Washington, D.C., who was ambassador to Washington. And he had been born again. He was a Methodist man, but he had really yeah. got to know the Lord. And I brought him down here to Topeka. And uh, I, from the governor's office on down, uh, important so-called people, we gathered together. And we had Myron Green's restaurant here at that time. and. Um, so there was a large number of people that came to hear what he had to say about Haiti. And um, so while he was here, um, and he would call every morning, I had him here at Ramadi, and he would call every morning and uh, he would uh, report to the president. Yeah. And uh, of course my name was mentioned uh, as one of the people that promoted that. And um, so the last day he handed me the phone to the president. I had never spoken to anyone high level like that. And so I said, Mr. President, after I talked a little bit, greeted, I said, um, do you have freedom of conscience or freedom of religion in Haiti? Yeah. He said, you must come and see. Well, when I passed the phone back to Arthur and he had hung up the phone, he said, the president wants you to come tomorrow. Oh, wow. And you'll be his personal guest in National Palace. The and, next day. Uh, well, I'd never done anything like that. And and I was I was shocked at the, the demand it might be on me, you know. So, uh, and he said he's authorized me to for your ticket and you'll be his guest. And so the next day, sure enough, I arrived in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, the airport about half the size it is now. Uh, and um, so we pulled, the plane pulled up and stopped and I glanced out, there was a presidential limousine down below and they asked the people just to wait just yeah. a moment. And so there was, a, some came on board and they knew my seat number by asking yeah. and said, are you, are you Mr. Manning? I said, yes. I didn't know if I was in trouble or what was going to happen. <laughs> and so they said, uh, we're from uh, the president's office and he's asked us to bring you. I said, don't worry about stamping a passport or your luggage. We'll see that you get that. So. I gave him my passport so they could stamp that. Well, so then uh, I got in the limousine and I was having a crush feeling. I thought he thinks I'm a politician uh -huh. and I don't even know what I'm gonna say to him. <laughs> I've never talked to a president that way before. So uh, they pulled up behind the National Palace and within Less than five minutes, I was right here at his door. He had four doors leading into his chamber. And so I was alone with him. Yeah. They didn't search me. Did I have a weapon or anything? Uh, he knew who I was, sure. but I, I didn't know that he knew that. And so I asked him after 
Oh, I present him a Bible. Mm -hmm. I thought Buddha preached, Lord, I have a Bible. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Sounds like a good thing. Yeah. So anyway, um, I said, well, Mr. President, I, I thought you might have thought I was a different person than I am, maybe a politician, since you, your personal limousine. No, he said, I, I know who you were. You're Reverend Manning. And I had planted a church here uh -huh. over on the east side. And so anyway, uh, I had over two hours with him. And uh, he gave me full attention. And we talked. And I found myself, I went to uh, Paul's teaching, mm -hmm. the powers that be are ordained of God. That yes. scripture fell on me. And I thought, here he is with these millions of people yeah. responsible for them. So I thought he would understand that language. Uh -huh. And uh, and I laid that on real heavy. Mr. President, it's awesome, the responsibility you have of, of your people. Well, he was known of killing quite a few That'd people. That'd be very brutal. Yeah, because if, if there was a group plotting his overthrow, yeah. he would take them out or have them taken out. So anyway, but he was, he was the kindest, humblest man with me, gentle. And uh, he said, Reverend, he said, would you help my people? Well, I said, Miss President, you're the second Haitian that I've met. I don't know your people. Yeah. But I can't promise a lot. But I said, if God leads me, I will, I will do so. Well, he was content with that. And... Um, so we talked about many things, and uh, then I asked him, may I pray for you? Yeah. And so I, just a young preacher, I, I just took his shoulder. He's the president. <laughs> I laid a hand on his head gently, and uh, when I did that, an yeah. alarm went off. <laughs> And they, these four doors, there was at least three soldiers with weapons at each door. And he motioned them back, you know. Yeah. I was just, I was just praying with him. Uh, so I prayed, and I feel if I ever prayed under the anointing of God, I did it there. Yeah. God gave me words to pray over him and over the nation. And, uh, and I, I didn't know that I would ever do any more than just visit there yeah and but that that same day i went down their city soleil and city mm -hmm. simone you know their ghetto areas uh they say city soleil has eight hundred thousand people yeah so city simone uh, uh, maybe a little less but i i went down on the street and i met a pentecostal preacher D uh, Dumas J. Arnold. Yeah. He later ran for president, but I asked him once, I said, Dumas, what is your platform going to be? And he laughed. He said, I'm going to, I'm going to be for the poor. Well, all Haiti is poverty. <laughs> but anyway, he didn't get too far in that yeah. election. But anyway, he became a, a fast friend of mine. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he asked me that day, he said, well, you want you want us some people to gather around, and he he had me up on a little box. Yeah. And I said, Brother Arnold, what what do you got in mind? He said, I want you to testify. And he said he shouted Hallelujah three or four times, and people gathered in there, like I'd never seen gather in, and I didn't have a lot to say to them. I didn't know them, you know, and but I just told him I I was a Christian. The Lord had brought me so far out of darkness and, yeah. and had put my feet on a solid rock and he takes care of me. He provides for me. I just testified to them. And uh, so Dumas wanted me to put the days I was there. So I went down and he lived down near the river and, and had a, well, anyway, long story short, uh, I can't even tell you how all these churches were planted. There's 22 orphanages yeah. we planted. And uh, sometimes they the missionaries would come to me and 
they would say, Reverend Mang, if you ever want to turn over a, 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 an orphanage that's going, uh, we would like to have that. Our people back home would like. Well, I said, you're welcome. I said, I've got other things to do. Yeah. So I would go from one to another. And uh, there was a Dr. Moody. He was uh, a big leader in the Church of God in Christ. He's uh -huh. from, uh, from uh, Chicago area. And he had a big church. And some of the black ladies would come. And they came one time when I was there. They came in off of the plane with poke sacks of post toasties and for the orphans and yeah. what have you. And I thought that was something because I always put them in boxes. But here they carrying them fresh, their milk and sugar and all yeah. of that. And so he asked me too. I had a I had a uh, I had a, a property the the president had given me to use if I would just. I had two properties there, and they sort of joined. And uh, but he said, uh, "Well, I asked, I asked the president. I said, what would my commitment be if I started orphanage here in a school?" And uh, he said, "If you just take care of the property main maintenance." Yeah. And he said, "You can be there as long." And so. He had a document made up. It's still on record wow. that Global Missions, I ha I just, I said I, that was one of the first times I was using Global Missions and uh, as a name, and uh, my name is registered there. But during a coup, uh, when uh, one of the presidents was there, that was after Papa Doc mm -hmm. had died, and his son, uh, when he wasn't there, uh, but uh, they uh, this one property was taken by soldiers. Yeah, you know? we had a bus. I could show the Jesus film up there on it. Yeah, and another brother and I had had that given to us. Had a generator in the front of the bus is for the doctor and the dentist. So. And we could go out a side of town and serve yeah. people. We did that many times. And uh, so I just fell in love with the Haitian people. And uh, I think anywhere you go, uh, one thing I'm proud of, um, I have a good testimony there. Yeah. People respect me. And uh, I didn't ask for it. I've tried mm -hmm. to live it. and. I try to keep my promises. Mm -hmm. If I say I'm going to plant a church or help you, I've tr yeah. always tried to do that. And you know, and people would just maybe I would say uh, it's going to plant a church, and there'd be somebody say, "Well, we would like to pay for that in memory mm -hmm. of a loved one." And back in those days, I could build a church for five thousand. Wow! You know, just the material. I I would tell a when I was planting a church. I would tell the people, I'd meet with them, and I said, now look, I I don't want to take your initiative away. You're members of this church, and they've been under maybe, uh, they may have been under a, what do you call it, a, the, uh, where you have meetings a lot of times, yeah. Brush Arbor. Yeah. Brush Arbor. <laughs> I couldn't think of that name. So I would tell, uh, maybe they'd been under that for years. All, mm -hmm. The only covering I had was limbs, you know, trees. So I said, I don't want to take away your initiative, but all I'm going to do is the foundation, the footing, the walls, and the roof. And then you, as a body of people, uh, are going to put in windows, yeah. the floor, and what have you. And... Uh, that would get them out, get them out, started. Get them started, yeah. Now, you know, one of the things that I've noticed being there several times with you in Haiti in ministry it is many of the preachers that come to the conferences that you'll put on, and uh, we'll do the pastor's conferences, and then we'll do night crusades and services um, like that. But many, many of those preachers that come, some of them are now in their 60s. Yes. And you have known them 
and really imparted into their life, spoken into their life, and fathered them in the Lord in a yeah. way, many of them since they were children. Yeah. And that's really a, a powerful part of the legacy that God, I think, has used you there to do. Well, and I, I think that is wonderful that Jesus said that your fruit might yeah. remain. And so, uh, brother, uh, brother, I mentioned to you earlier this yeah. today, uh, brother Astro, Astro Vincent. Vincent. Uh, his mother brought him to a meeting I was holding in City Soleil. He was only nine years old, wow. and you knew Vincent. Yeah. He he had the biggest uh -huh. smile, and he was uh, a nice, good-sized man. Uh, he wasn't so tall, but he was, he was, and he, he, he was a real man of God. Yeah. But his mother brought him and he said he wanted to see me, his mother said. I walked over to him. Here's a nine-year-old child and uh, someone had to interpret this because he didn't speak English yet. And um, so I told him, I said, uh, Astro, I said, someday uh, Jesus is going to use you and you're going to be a leader of leaders. You think about that. Yeah. And he would, he had that big smile and he just smiled big like he was so proud of that. But I actually was speaking prophetically to mm -hmm. him and didn't know it. That's I right. mean, I was just saying what I was feeling in my heart. Well, uh, so here we buried him the other day at six, age 61. And, uh, but the church, you've seen the church there, yeah. it would seat between two and 3,000. Yeah. And some churches here in Topeka uh, are going to stack chairs so they give our, our, the pews. Yeah. The First Southern Baptist yeah. Community Church and some others and the United Pentecostal out here on um, California. They, we've taken all of these chair benches down because they don't have a, uh, a factory that mm. you can build pews. And so, so many are, don't yeah. have any place to sit. And so sometimes they're almost tearful when they see all of these pews coming in and they're the most beautiful furniture because they're not accustomed to that. They're mm. extremely poor, as you know. Yeah. And so, uh, so Vincent's church, uh, we had, Mary and I had, uh, we had this Christmas dinner. Uh, she had this thought over 50 years ago, uh, have our, our, a, a Christmas dinner for orphans and widows. And Haiti has many, many widows. Uh, the, the earthquake, we had 300,000 people die in 43 seconds. Yeah. Think of that yeah. in 2010. And it left so many yeah. widows. And um, so so we, she, this was just, people just caught on. And I know Brother Rogers Church has helped. Yeah. And uh, toys and, uh, and things yeah. for the widows and uh, sewing things. And, and so, um, we delighted in that till the day that she passed, and then we've carried this tradition yeah. on. We've kept it going, and that's a good time to go. You know, yeah. you, and all of the children and all of the widows, we always make sure they have salvation. We pray, mm -hmm. and some of the children can really pray up a storm. That's you? right, they can. Yeah. Now you share a, a story to me before. Every time we would go to Jeremy, we always pass by. I think it's. Even the area. Well, before we get there, there's a place near St. Louis, and you always tell me of a time when God had sent you there to plant a church, and there was a man standing on the yeah. roof that had confronted you. Could you tell us well, about that? Yeah, this man was actually standing on the ground. Uh, I had five young men with me, as I recall, and uh, they could interpret, uh, and uh, because I've never been good at linguistics, I've, I've had some some yeah. embarrassing times when I would say words that um, thought I was speaking sure. their language, but 
I had to apologize a few times. Uh, but anyway, um, yes, this was my first church in, in Haiti. Mm -hmm. It was out about 150 miles. Well, it's between Jeremy and yeah. Port-au-Prince, uh, where you've been. And um, so going there, when I visited later, all the buildings weren't around there mm -hmm. at that time. It was just the beach. And, yeah. And I was wondering, and then a few little buildings, and I thought, well, I asked his boys, I said, we're going to determine where this church should be planted. Mm -hmm. And we walked about, and then there was a little white-haired man. Uh, he just suddenly appeared there, and he spoke perfect English, here I had, I'd had a little bit of malaria, you know, I had a bad uh -huh. kind of a headache that day. And I even stopped on the journey out and uh, just rested a little bit, but then we continued on. So here our mind was, where does the Lord want this church planted? And this man stepped out and he had a powerful little voice. He said, Max Manning, we don't want you here. Oh, wow. And I, I felt humiliated at first. I thought, yeah. I thought they really didn't want me. But then the Lord said, uh, he cried out again, Max Manning, we don't want you here. And then the Lord said, that man don't speak English. And said, that's demons speaking yeah. through him. Wow. And so when he quickened me that way, and he quickened me suddenly, and he was about 10 feet away, and some of the boys were around, and I just pointed at him, I didn't touch him. Yeah. I said, you foul, unclean spirits, come out. And God knocked him senseless. Wow. So he was lying there on the sand, and uh, I told his boys, I said, whatever you do, uh, get him saved. Yeah. You speak his language. And I said, the Lord said that was, he couldn't speak English. And so I said, and get him filled with the Holy Ghost if you can, and while he's down. And I, well, they went to work on him, and they were very young men, were yeah. so on fire for God. And they got him saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. And um, he became our first convert wow. in the church. And the long Praise story God. short, uh, he. Uh, and he acknowledged he couldn't speak English. Yeah. I tried to speak English to him, but he... The devil he, was speaking through him. Yeah, through him. Yeah. And I'd never had anything. Everything was happening new with me in life, just <laughs> all kinds of things. And uh, so uh, we established established the place where we'd have the church. Yeah. And it's sitting there today. today. You saw it. Yeah. Now, we took, since you were there... Uh, St. Louis, mm -hmm. uh, I took pews down and we filled that church yeah. with pews. And I believe I, maybe I told you. And uh, now the pastor, you met the pastor. Yes. We came in from uh, Jeremy. We were together, weren't we? I believe so. Yeah. So we, we got down and, oh, they knew I was, they hadn't seen me all mm -hmm. those years. Uh, I, the one that help found the church you yeah. know, or did find it found it so we uh we were coming down we'd finished there at jeremy and uh i believe it was in two vehicles and so we pulled up by the church and here now this young man i started out he had two children mm -hmm. two small children at that time john pierre joykin and uh now that was way way back more than 50 years and he was just about 19 years of age he yeah. and his wife and uh, so uh, when we pulled in I started opening the door to the car and here was this tall man he 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 wasn't John Pierre Joy and a little thin man but here he was a grown yeah. man and all those years on him and I said, well, sir, he was standing right in my face. I said, do I know you? I didn't know what he wanted. He said, tell me. 
tell me who I am. He could speak English. Mm -hmm. And it dawned on me, this was him after all those years. Wow. And uh, he said they want to hear from you, uh, people, you know. And uh, so I think, the Lord. I think that night we raised an offering or something. Amen. Now, Reverend Manning, the time that you spent with the Voice of Healing and many of the men that we've, we've spoken about, Brother Branham, Brother Coe, mm -hmm. Alan, Lindsay, Jack Moore, many, many of those other great men of God in that era, the powerful miracles that God did, uh, cancers disappearing, falling into people's hands, mm -hmm. the hospital beds being emptied up. I, I spent some time recently with Jack Coe's daughter and she told me of the ambulances would actually take the people in the wheelchairs to the meeting, not to the hospital, they did. but they would take them to the meeting. And the, the anointing that was present in those meetings in that day, the miracles that had happened in those meetings was, was so, were so powerful, but were so pervasive. They, were, they would often, everyone would be healed in, in, many, in many cases. And what would you say from your time spending alongside many of those men and, and, and your years of ministry, what would you say separates men of God like that and the anointing that they carry from what we're experiencing and what we see today in the pulpit? Well, I guess there's a couple of things. One is uh, they all seem to have a definite calling on their life. I mean, they, they were yeah. aware of that. They knew that, so they in turn would, all, all of them that I heard talk and share, they all had a divine encounter with God, a supernatural yeah. encounter. Uh, I mean, some of them were, were astounding as they talked about, and they were changed, they were transformed uh, in their lives. Uh, most all of them had gone on a long, long protracted fast. Yeah. And they were, they were wanting to obey God, but they wanted to be equipped supernaturally. And uh, now, you mentioned miracles, uh, Jack Cole. Uh, you witnessed these; they were valid. But there came a time in his life, and I remember this very well, because I was praying for him, at, as Gordon Lindsay. Uh, joined him in, I think it's Jacksonville, Florida. Yeah. Uh, he was uh, charged with practicing medicine without a license, yeah. and he was he went to he went to court. So, Brother Lindsay uh, went down, loaded with scripture, and uh, so the judge got to hear a lot of Bible and <laughs> testimony, and, and there was people that they were healed, healed yeah. supernaturally. They could testify and certify they'd been healed. Yeah. So that was put to the test and he was exonerated. And yeah, so the common denominator would be a personal encounter with God and they spent a protracted time in fasting and prayer. Well, you know, and and mine was mine was just simple. I mean, I'm I don't have background yeah. theological and and I felt I was a good Marine, but yeah. how does that fit into the picture sure. of the ministry, you know? But I had I had an encounter. I had heard that they had encounters, but I was trying to copy that. But people would tell me uh, I, I'd been saved, filled the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. and I'd walk I'd walk down streets, uh, yeah. wanting to lead people to Christ. That was my burden, and. Uh, so people were saying because I was doing that, oh, you ought to be in the ministry. You ought to be a preacher. Uh -huh. And I told Mary, I said, no way that I would be a preacher unless I heard it from Jesus Christ that he, that he told me. And I, I said, uh, I couldn't do it at all. I couldn't stand before people. You know, I, I, I had true humility. It mm. wasn't a false humility, but... I honestly felt that way. Yeah. I, if I was in the Marines, I could shout, I could do this, but 
not to stand before people and talk about these things. So finally it came down, it, it got agitating, just more and more people was telling me, you ought to be a preacher. And um, so I told Mary, and that was 717 Poplar Street, Topeka, Kansas. I said we had a little two bedroom house and that's where we adopted our first child. Yeah. And so I, uh, I told her, I said, uh, I've got to get this resolved. And I said, I'm going on a water fast. And I said, don't, don't worry about me. I've heard that others have done this. And I'd, I'd read the 58th chapter of Isaiah. It talked all about fasting. And so I said, you can join me at times if you want. Uh, but I said, I've got to hear from God. So I was there day after day on the carpet and I was pleading with the Lord, Lord, I'm, you know that I'll go anywhere you want me to go. I've already traveled uh, for my government. I'll yeah. go anywhere and I'll do anything you want me to do. But I, I, I'm not equipped with anything. I, I didn't finish high school, in fact. Yeah. And uh, I got a, what do you call it? A GED. GED. <laughs> yeah, I, I finally learned about that. Well, anyway, but I, I had a reason for not going because I was getting ready to go to the Marines. So anyway, uh, I struggled and prayed and prayed and Mary would join me. And uh, so on the 18th day, I was alone in the house and I said, Lord, I've got to hear from you. Mm. And I, I was, you know, he knows our thoughts are far off. Yeah. And so he told, he spoke and he I stand on my feet. And it was a voice like none other. It was, wow. was the same voice I heard later, but it's gentle, but it's commanding and direct. But he said, uh, hold, I've called you with a holy calling. Mm. And it just, I, I nearly, I was weakened from fasting, but I couldn't hardly handle all that. And I had heard preachers in, um, out of Texas, they would say, if I don't hear from you this week with yeah. finances, I'll be forced to go off the air. And I said, when he said I was called, I said, Lord, I can't do that. That flashed in my mind. And he told me a scripture I I had never read uh, the call, the gifts and calling without repentance. Yeah. But I said, Lord, what does that mean? See, he was he had me in a place for I there'd be no return. Yeah. I, that's what I needed, and he knew all of that. And he said, when I call someone, I don't change my mind about. It. He was telling yeah. me, son, I'm not changing my mind. You have a, I've mm. I've got a calling for you. Well, it wasn't a great calling. It was just to be a, a servant of God. And and then I read where Jesus said, I no longer call you servants yeah. because a servant does so and so. But he said, as friends, yeah. you're friends. Uh, why, all the things the Father has told me, I will share with you. Well, I read that. I would be a friend of God. And that greatly enthused me. But then, all at once, while he was talking, I saw Africa. Yeah. I saw a multitude of people. And I saw myself up there preaching. I couldn't believe. Here I was, suited up, people out there, and it only lasted a few seconds. Yeah. But I guess God was letting me see that I mm. could do that. Yeah. And then it went away. And uh, then he told me, to the kind of a life he would anticipate for me. I would live, I would be, should be humble yeah. and honor him. And that's why I've tried my best to, I don't know if it pleases everybody. Jesus said, everyone is not going to love you that's all right. the time. They'd be hated sometimes. And I suppose I've had some of that, but it yeah. wasn't too noticeable. But uh, anyway, uh, 
And then he told me where to go to Valley Falls, Kansas, plant a church now, and her husband. You know, I've mentioned many times before, but I've only met you over the last six or six years or so. Yeah. And at at your age, most preachers would already be retired. Oh. You know, uh, most of the ones that I know have would be retired at the beach or retired somewhere else and have given it up a long time. But you yet are still active in ministry. Well, and I, I, I still have a, a burden for souls. Yeah. And I, I know Roger knows about these things. Uh, it takes quite a commitment to be on radio yeah. and and uh, to travel, but that's my assignment. That's mm. the Lord. Well, he, he knows I'll go anywhere and pay any price. It, it doesn't it doesn't matter to me. I've been to some of the most terrible nations, wickedness. You talk about witchcraft. I've been in cities where they were embedded with witchcraft and witches yeah. in Africa. Yeah. And but that's that's who I am. I'm just to go as a child of God and if nobody else goes with me, I yeah. would go, you know. Yeah. And uh, what what advice would you give to um, young preachers today? Well, I'll tell you, I'm right at this stage. I'm still a young preacher. The way I feel, I'm just, I'm like a beginner, you yeah. know. I don't, I don't have any vast knowledge and, and all of these things. I'm just, and I'm so dependent, and that's what I would tell them, be dependent totally on God. Yeah. And be prepared to suffer if you must, or go the second mile, or, or, Jesus said, "Before they hate you, they've been hated. They yeah. hated hated me. It was very clear. Yeah. And they said that he said they even hated my father. Yeah. They hate him, their father, and they're going to hate you. Yeah. That's a part of the promise is when you step out. He promised they would hate. Yeah. You. That's and right. And everybody's not going to love you. Yeah. And think you're just a wonderful man of God. Yeah. No. And you'll be challenged." And uh, and then some of us may pay the ultimate. Yeah. I uh, I'm willing to do that. I don't want to do that. I don't look forward to anything like that. But uh, if, if that's what God closes my life out with, there's even a martyr's crown. Yeah. I mean, I he uh, he has a way of paying you. He does. Yeah. He does. So I. But I just, I just want to finish my journey. Uh, I, I, I'm, I just, I was born poor, but at the same time, uh, he's provided all my needs. Yeah. Uh, the year twenty nine to thirty nine was the Great Depression. Mm. I lived those. We went to bed hungry at night. Yeah. So I know where they sat. You know, I've sat where they sat. Yeah. And we didn't have toys at Christmas. Yeah. We didn't have shoes when it was time to go to school. Yeah. A lot of good shoes. And um, holes in our mm. clothes. Mother patched them. She, yeah. She didn't go to Walmart. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah. But, but God provided. God provided. And then I think to be an example, you know, when I, when I was first, started the ministry uh i thought oh what am i doing here with these mm. men of god uh, i'm sitting with the class they were pastors from yeah and and i try to i try to hide behind some fellow that was taller than i and so that whoever was up in front wouldn't notice or call mm. me because i i wouldn't know what to say but then invariably they at Brother Manning, it, and it put me on the spot. So there's no way of of hiding. Yeah. So I guess just to be obedient to the Lord, yeah. and uh, 
he's our all in all and I I um, I just think I've spoiled your whole program. Oh no. I don't no. So Reverend Manny, I, I wanna thank you for spending some time with us today and just sharing what God has done, what you've been a part of, what you've witnessed in the Voice of Healing days, and what God has used you to do throughout um, Haiti, your ministry around the world. And so I want to thank you for your time, for sharing um, how God has impacted your life and worked through your life. And it's my prayer that it's a blessing to the younger generation that may watch this still and hear it from someone who lived through it and experienced what God did. And know that Jesus, according to Hebrews 13, 8, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Mm -hmm. And that if God did it in 1940 and 1960, yes, he he'll do it in 2060 right. and 3060 and however long he gives us until Jesus comes. So I want to I thank you for your time. I thank you for your friendship, for your prayers, and for your invitation to minister alongside you so many times in Haiti. And I thank you for not retiring. Well, because had you retired and gone off to Florida or wherever it would have been, I would have never met you. And you have impacted my life in ways that are immeasurable. Just in, in, in minor things that you've said in my life, whether we would be sitting preparing to go to the morning conference in Haiti, eating our breakfast. You know, I remember one time you looked at me. You came down in the morning one of our first couple trips there and you sat down and you started to eat and you looked over at me and you said you know Chad the longer you pray at night the less time you'll have to spend praying for the people during the day that's true yeah. and you said that to me and then you turned almost as if you didn't realize you said it you turned and continued eating your food <laughs> and I sat there for a minute and I knew that God at that moment had spoken to me yeah. and I've remembered those times and, and those things that you've said, um, the conversations that we've had. So I want to thank you for that. I want to thank you for your time here, um, allowing me to interview oh. you for a little bit. And for everybody that's watching on The Voice of Revival, I'm with Reverend Max Manning, and I hope you enjoy this time. I, I pray that it blesses your soul and your spirit in the name of Jesus. Until next time, God bless you. Thank you for watching Voice of Revival with Chad McDonald. The Voice of Revival broadcast is a media ministry outreach of Revival Fire World Ministries and is made possible by the prayers and faithful support of partners like you. All gifts and contributions are tax deductible where allowed by law. For more information or to give, visit us on the web at www.thevoiceofrevival.com or write Revival Fire World Ministries, P.O. Box 5444. Cleveland, Tennessee, 37320.